Joining us now, our legal analyst, Paul Harding from Martin Harding and Mazzotti. Hey, Paul. Hey, good morning, guys. Good morning. So, hey, what do you think about Manti Hose? <laughs> no, I, I caught the end of that. You know, I, I uh, boy, it was the first time I heard of it, and I don't, I'm not prepared to make a statement. About <laughs> yeah. Good yeah. instincts. We're keeping you on top of all the current trends in men's fashion. Yeah, oh, okay. great. Hey, uh, real quickly before we get to the employer and Facebook thing, uh, this this yeah. never this uh, this ongoing trial. It's been going on forever in Troy. The the voter fraud trial. I'm just yeah. as astounded. All right, they, they've gone through all this testimony. Six weeks. They had a, they had a I guess four alternate jurors. Two had to quit. Anyway. Anyway, long story short, they dismissed the final two alternate jurors. And then yesterday, during deliberations, one of the jurors is carted out in a gurney, may not be able to return, maybe a mistrial. What? How? Why do they get rid of the alternate jurors? You know, during the deliberations, it makes no sense to me. Yeah, they sort of say, "Well, you made it this far," and, and the argument is, "Why not just keep them there till there's a conclusion?" But the, well, what they do is at the conclusion of the trial, they do dismiss the alternates. And then what happens often, especially in a high-profile case, is the alternates now start talking about the case. They start talking possibly to, to the media. I don't recall it happening here. Yeah. But they get influenced by the outside. And therefore, to bring them back requires the, uh, the approval of both prosecution and defense. And the defense in this case is just, just never going to allow it. Wouldn't it make more sense to... If you had, like, two extra jurors, let them sit in the deliberation room, even if they're not participants? Well, they can't sit in the deliberation room. Uh, I, I Listen, it, it's it's just not the way it's done. I, yeah. I mean, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Certainly in this case, it makes all the sense in the world. But the issue being, they'd have to sit there and just, you know, put, put tape over their mouth because they can't say anything to influence the deliberation. Mm -hmm. The theory being that the two of them could sit in a soundproof booth somewhere, right. and then when it comes time, if they're called upon, they come in, and they have to begin deliberations again. Mm -hmm. But at some point, it becomes tainted, right? Because now they missed out on the early deliberations, and the defendant is saying, look, at, you know, this, this one juror leaving has now put me in a difficult position. I can consent to it. But the general theme as you're defending a case is, you know, delay, delay, mistrial, let's start it again. Right. We'll do better the second time. Well, one quick question on this is the jurors haven't been sequestered. So really, what harm would there be in bringing these alternates back? Because the rest of the jury haven't been sequestered at all. They're, they haven't been sheltered from the media. They've been going home. Yes, yeah, very, very good question. What happens is, is that they're told every day when they go home, don't read the newspaper, don't talk to anyone in your family or your circle, the media, or anyone about this case. So going home is, you know, and whether they do it or not, you hope they do it, but now once you're released from jury duty, now you get into all the intricacies and you get into the whole thing and you get influenced by your family, your friends, and the media. So, in, in uh, you know, it's a bit of a, a and again, it, it's, a, it's a tough slicing argument here because possibly they're doing it anyway, but the spirit of being an alternate juror or a juror is that when you leave the courtroom and you're not sequestered, you go home and you don't dive into discussions with yeah. anyone about the case. And, and I guess they, they do have the option of proceeding with 11 jurors, but both the prosecution and defense would have to agree. And the defense doesn't want to. And as you said, you know, delay, delay, mistrial. You never know what's going to happen. Do better the second yeah. time around. So, And maybe they <laughs> might not even re retry it given the expense. Uh, really quickly on to the, the Facebook thing. Yeah, there have been cases where people have been in job interviews and the, uh, the uh, interviewer has asked them to log on to their Facebook page in front of them and, and let them see all the things they have on their Facebook. Another company is making their employees automatically accept friend requests from their bosses. Can they do that? They can. Uh, it happens true with college admissions and, and uh, you know, going for a job, being part of an athletic team. The general theme is this. You know, it's just another screening process. I mean, we make the argument that we give our social security number when we apply to a position, whether it's in college or whether it's a job. And what do they do? They do a background check. They see what your criminal history is, if you've had a bankruptcy. The argument that they're making in this case, hey, this is First Amendment protection uh, in a real general sense, right, of privacy. But in a private practice, in a uh, something that is not a right, I mean, you're applying for this position. Everyone, all, We all don't get to go to Harvard. But mm -hmm. those who get to go to Harvard are going to be scrutinized and looked at, and therefore they're being told, Provide us with all this information, uh, and uh, including Facebook. The so people can say, no, I don't want to go to Harvard. And, and that's the argument. I, I know this legislation pending, not in New York and a couple other states, 
but boy, it just feels like a bunch of noise. I just don't see it going anywhere. I mean, I guess the general rule is don't post anything that would incriminate you, but it's almost, it's your private space. It's almost like them coming into your home or them tagging along on a date. You know, it, it's what you do outside of work or outside of the classroom. Right, but during a, we've all been through a job interview, and some of us have interviewed people, and you got that half hour or hour where they're sitting there, and you're looking across the table at them, and you're, you're assessing everything. You, you know, what do they look like? You know, how, are how are they dressed? How is their speech? And then you ask them, oh, so what do you do? What are your hobbies? What do you like to do? And you're going to get answers, and then you're going to get references. You're going to go out, and you're going to talk to the people that they tell you, know you. This is just a, a little more in-depth and a little more personal. I get it. Uh, but, you know, right now, the current state of the law, if you're going to go out and apply for a job with the police department or, or just a, just a, any job, assume that your friends and friends of friends and friends are going to have some connection to that employer, and they're going to be reading your Facebook. Thanks, Paul. Enjoy okay, the visit. We'll talk, to you, we'll talk to you soon. Paul Harding from Martin Harding and Mazzotti, 1-800-LAW-1010.